This video is in partnership with Children's Tumor Foundation. Okay, so you guys submitted your unpopular opinions about Quora. Some of you don't know what the meaning of unpopular is, but let's get to them right now. Number one from Lord Snowball. I like Legend of Korra. I think that's an unpopular opinion, or I think that's unpopular enough. Uh, yes, that is an unpopular opinion, I would say, among, I would say the core fan base. I think among casual fans, they generally are like, I like it, I think it's cool, but I think it's like the core fan base, especially those who are like, who would claim themselves to be diehard Airbender fans, would say that they don't um, uh, like uh, Korra. Though I have been seeing lately, as people have been re-watching it, I've been seeing a lot of opinions changing in that people are not saying that it's great or that it's better than Airbender or anything like that, but that they have enjoyed it a lot more than what they remembered uh, from seeing it, you know, years ago. So yeah, definitely unpopular opinion uh, that you like Legend of Korra, especially five years ago, it was an unpopular opinion if you didn't like uh, Legend of Korra, for sure. Mako and Bolin were the most interesting characters in the show. Um... No, I don't think I agree with that one. I, I, I can kind of see where you're coming from, I guess, from like the things that they were doing in book three, maybe, when they were going back to Ba Sing Se and, you know, meeting with their family again. But in terms of them being interesting characters on their own, uh, especially with Mako, like Mako definitely brings down that whole thing with, with Bolin. Because I think Bolin's more interesting, or not interesting, but uh, I'm okay with him just being Bolin. But Mako, he's kind of boring, man. He's, he's kind of a blank slate. And I don't know if I really am super jazzed about him. For me, the most interesting characters on the show are the villains. Uh, typically, you know, like I'm talking about like Red Lotus, I'm talking about Amon, I'm talking about Kuvira, even Unlock to an extent, although I think he went too off, far off the deep end. But yeah, those are the most interesting characters to me. I think Su Yin was a very interesting character. I like that dynamic she had with uh, Lin and her sister. Even Toph, old Toph, I think was kind of cool how they did her. Yeah, there's definitely a few characters I would put above Bo Lin and Mako, so disagree on that one. Bolin was more attractive than Mako. Personal opinion. Uh, um, I think I agree with that actually. <laughs> Thinking about it, I think I would be way more attracted to Bolin than I would Mako, especially seeing him on the date with Korra when they were just eating noodles and just like belching and having fun with each other. Uh, I think he's he, he's a cooler dude to hang around with than uh, than Mako's brooding all the time. Even when Mako got kind of better in book four, I still wouldn't want to hang out with that guy. So yeah, I agree. Bowling all the way. Number four, the worst episodes of the entire franchise were Beginnings Part 1 and 2. Now this is a new unpopular opinion. I only have heard semi-recently, like in the last month or so, and I definitely don't agree with it. Uh, I think, uh, and I've heard the arguments, or the main argument that I've heard against it is that it makes the, the world feel more black and white and that it's just good versus evil but and then this notion that they shouldn't have done that when really i don't think it was a case of good and evil it was more of a case of chaos versus harmony and balance is harmony or harmony is balance and vice versa and i think people are kind of misconstruing the idea of there has to be as much good as there is bad when really that that isn't really the case for when we're talking about balance i think balance the notion, and this even comes up in Star Wars, and I actually wanna make a full video about this, but it, uh, I guess the too long, did not read, if you don't wanna you know, get that whole video, the, the short version of it, what I'm trying to say is that like, I think people today have this neutrality bias to what balance means. Um, and people think it's like a, a direct middle between someone being doing very, very good and, and someone doing very, very evil, when I think it's more about harmonizing and, and, and working together, which is more on the end of being on the on the good side or whatever, and less about, no, you have to do exactly the amount of bad deeds as you do as good deeds. But again, I'm going off on a tangent. I'm gonna make a whole video about that. But yes, I disagree on that notion that they are the least interesting or that they those episodes were, were poor or ruined the franchise or anything like that. Ooh, and this next one is a long one. Number five, the beginning portrayal of the origins of bending did not ruin the lore, but it actually fixed it. I found the ambiguous, we learn bending from the original benders, the animals tell, somewhat ridiculous because it exposes a lot of, uh, it exposes a lot of loopholes, i.e. 
Why do the people of the different nations stop learning from the animals? Does learning from the animals mean that someone from, say, the Fire Nation can learn airbending from an air bison? Could Sokka learn airbending from Appa if he wanted to? He literally dated the moon spirit once. Couldn't she teach him how to water bend? Who gets to learn how to bend and who can't? Why are there still non-benders in the various nations? Still, most of the original benders are still in existence, uh, with the exception of the dragons and sky bisons during the events of uh, Avatar Legend of, uh, I'm sorry, Avatar The Last Airbender. Beginnings fix this narrative loophole. Technically, it does not even completely change the lore. The bending techniques were still learned from the original benders. I completely agree with it. I don't even have much to add. You probably you said basically everything that I always try to say to people who make this claim about you know the beginnings, origin episode ruining the lore when it absolutely does not. It, it if it, it just adds something to the lore, it has a better explanation. It runs in parallel with the lore. It doesn't overwrite the lore. And you said it all there. You know, like they they. It makes more sense that the bending came, like the mystical part of bending, came from a specific source, and that the original benders, the, the animals who naturally could bend those elements, taught humans the martial art of how to actually bend the elements. So yes, I completely agree. Let's move on. Number six, that Julie and Varric were one of the best couples of all time. I actually disagree. I actually really disagree with this. And I also thought it was weird. I remember when watching book four for the first time, I was like, this is a weird commentary on this relationship. Cause clearly prior to that, it was Julie being this assistant who was kind of irritated and annoyed with her, her boss. And then she develops this attraction to him. I don't know. I, I personally felt that was off and weird to me when I first watched it. And then when I did that whole uh, Julie compilation video and then I saw people saying like, everybody should have them a Julie. I thought that was a little bit problematic. Cause I'm like, what are you saying? You want someone who does everything for you? I mean, I get it. I, I do understand it to a certain extent because I do understand the idea of wanting a partner who is, you know, you're ride and die. You want somebody who's there with you. But at the same time, she was doing a little bit more than just ride and die. She was kind of slaving over Varric in a little way. And, I, and it's kind of this weird slave wife situation going on. I mean, I granted the, the attraction was, was mutual and then she got her one up on him in book four when, you know, she turned the tables on him with the Kuvira Gambit thing. But again, I, mm -mm. I don't, I don't, I don't think their relationship was very healthy, and I don't think that was something that I would say that I would uh, be a fan of. But hey, different opinions, different strokes, different folks. Number seven, Aang being portrayed to be not the best father does not ruin his character, but in fact fits it pretty well. First off, Aang doesn't have a father. Zuko mentions this early on in book one. And although he did have Monk Yatso as a parental figure, his time with him was short, so he still never got an idea for what a father is. Second, Aang spent time with Tenzin the most because he was an airbender and Aang wanted to keep the air nomads traditions alive through him. And this fits Aang's character because we see him want to preserve the past in the show and in the graphic novels. I'm not saying Aang was the worst parent in the world that would go to Ozai. And I still think he cared and loved all his kids equally. He just spent more time with Tenzin, not in a father and son way, but more like an elder passing traditions over to the next generation, which I get why the show would characterize him this way in Legend of Korra. And then also I had uh, somebody from Discord add on a note about this. Uh, Matthew Chapman says, uh, Bumi and Kaya gained some resolution here as well. The season doesn't conclude in the note that Aang was a poor father. He just wasn't perfect and the show doesn't hold him to that standard. Fans do. And honestly, I don't even know. I, you guys are making this video for me. Like, I, I mean, especially for the people who I'm agreeing with, and obviously I agree with this comment. I, it's so ridiculous when I when I see people who have put Aang on this pedestal or when people put um, any character on pedestals. I think that happens a lot, especially with Airbender, is that the characters kind of become larger than life or uh, become these sort of saints or, or or they can do no wrong or they should they only deserve the best but then forgetting that they're human beings and that characters should have flaws something that i talk about in my other uh, unpopular opinions video which you can watch somewhere around here but yes characters have flaws they should have flaws and i think this one is completely in line with ang and yes it's not that he didn't love his children equally is that yes he had to focus on the airbender kid because that was going to be the last airbender once ang died there was no one else to pass it off to so yeah i are i talked about this in my uh before you watch season two video go ahead and watch that if you want to see my full opinion on that number eight even though he had little screen time iroh the second is one of the best characters in the show in my opinion 
gonna have to disagree with you on that one. <laughs> Number nine, Milo is better comic relief than Sokka and Momo. I agree with Momo. Don't really care much for Momo. I definitely find Milo more funny than a Momo, but you can't put Milo over Sokka. That's just, that's just no. Before we continue on the video, I wanted to take this time to talk about the Children's Tumor Foundation, who is in partnership with this video. If you guys have a few extra dollars in your pocket, since its formation, the Children's Tumor Foundation has been crucial to the development of solid scientific data about the genetic disorder in F. Uh, thanks to the generosity of their other donors and sponsors, they have been breaking through barriers and forging a pathway that will lead to a cure. Now, this is not a sponsored video. This is not for profit. None of this money goes to me. This is completely all for charity. Uh, so if you can, uh, go ahead and uh, hit the uh, fundraiser button that should be uh, attached to the bottom of this video. All right, back to the video. Number 10, it wasn't Korra's fault that her connection to her past lives were severed. Oh my God, how I agree with this. And what's been perpetuated over these last five, six years since the show originally came out is that now there's this idea that since people don't really rewatch the show or rewatch season two or book two in particular, there's just this zeitgeist of people just saying that, ah, oh, Core is the worst. Core uh, got rid of the past lives. Core did this. And when I first was interacting with that situation, I thought they meant, oh, okay, they, they, they just disagree with the writers and the, they're talking about Core of the series doing away with the past lives, but no. More often than not, when I interact with these people, they say no, specifically Core ruined it. And no one ever seems to talk about Unavatu or Unalak, who was the one who stripped the past lives out of her and destroyed them, not Korra. Korra didn't go up one day and be like, you know what, I'm sick of the past lives, bye. Like that's the way people make it sound. That's not what happened. She had a fight with somebody and they took the freaking past lives from her. Stop it, stop that right now. Number 11, book two is good. Yeah, it's good. But I wouldn't say it's great. And I don't want to have to go on the inverse and someone being like, it's the greatest season ever. It's like, uh, it's not. It, it has its flaws. There's these issues with it, uh, especially, especially with that in-between stuff with some of the character arts were just forgotten about entirely. I feel, I feel like Korra got a reset. Mako got a reset. Bolin sort of did a reset or wasn't the same character that I liked in the first season. And then he's doing some, uh, Suyin, like there's so many characters that just weren't the same. And then some of the plot lines, yeah, they just didn't go over so well, but it's not terrible. It's not trash. It's not, it's not bottom tier. It's bottom tier for, for Avatar status. Yeah, sure, I agree with that. But I don't think it's bottom tier in terms of like animation overall, so yeah. Book two is good. Number 12, give Mako a break. I mean, what would you do if you had to choose between Korra or Asami? <laughs> I, I don't know, man. I mean, that was kind of messed up, especially when your brother previously just told you that she, he was into the girl like that you're now kissing and making out with. Like, I don't know. I don't, I, I, I don't know if I, I mean, I get it. He's in a tough situation. Like, yeah, two beautiful girls. You like them for different reasons. That, that's the typical thing of love triangles, right? But Mako could have handled that a lot better. Number 13, after season two, Mako was a good character. Um, Mako was a better character. He wasn't a good character. I still think, I mean, I, I think book four, I think does the best for him. I think he gets a little bit more development. And I think that his arc kind of got stolen at the end of book four, because I think he should have died at the end of book four. And I think he should have made that sacrifice and that kind of got ruined for him. But yeah, he got better, but I don't think he's good. Number 14, Suyin was selfish and wrong. Lin was more than right in being angry with Suyin. Her face was sliced open by her sister, who was a criminal, never apologized, left home at 16 to continue as a pirate before she was finally ready to settle down using her wealth to buy land. I never really thought about that actually. She did buy her land with, with criminal money probably, right? Lin has worked hard to maintain order in a crime field city for decades. Suyin did not share the wealth of Zhao Fu with others. When Earth Kingdom fell into chaos and everyone went to her for help, she refused, proving she would never accept responsibility. She was never there for Kuvira, which led to her eventual defection. Suyin was selfish and only cares for her direct family. I feel personally attacked because I think Suyin, Suyin is one of my favorite characters and 
I can't say you're wrong. I really can't say you're wrong. I think you actually are right. She is a little bit self-centered and selfish. And it, it, that does come up in the show itself. So it did, it's not like I am just completely blind to it. You know, the fact that Kuvira left and the fact that she wasn't really doing anything. She's very isolationist about Zhao Fu. Um, yeah. No, you're not wrong. I mean, she, she is those things, but I still like her. I don't know. I just like her. I like her progressive attitude. Again, she's a flawed character, of course, as all characters should be. Um, I, I think her benefits, her positive out, outweigh her negatives. Um, but yeah, no, you're not wrong. You're not wrong. I have to admit it. I have to admit it. Number 15, Uncle Iroh never had a wild romance with the ticket woman, which she clearly deserved. I mean, never think about that, but when did, I never did have romance, did he? I mean, he we saw him kind of like flirting with Aunt Wu and then yeah, with the ticket lady, and that it kind of comes off that he's a ladies' man, but then you know, he went off, he goes off into the spirit world. And I would assume that being able to go to the spirit world means that you don't have any familial ties, like kind of similar to airbending, and when you're able to fly is when you get rid of your earthly tethers. So, yeah, it seems like he never ended up with anybody, and it seems like uh, Iroh would be happy it looks like he he seemed like a guy who could find love in old age and like you know live with a woman for the rest of his life but yeah no it kind of sucks number 16 amon being a bender doesn't ruin him as a villain or the equalist as a whole if anything it adds to him as a villain because he's proving his own point he's a bender using his bending to manipulate non-benders i'll have to agree with you on this i was one of those people who initially when i first watched the series wasn't a fan of what they did with Amon. I thought it was more interesting if Amon was just like just this master class she bender and just non bender who really discovered, you know, this master class she blocking that didn't have anything to do with blood bending. But upon my rewatch, I did kind of like the hypocrisy of Amon. And that's kind of the point, right? I think the point is that with almost all the villains actually in every season, they all have this point they want to get across. But then there's also a hypocrisy that pops up on it as well. And I think that's an interesting dynamic. And yes, okay, I'll give that to you. I'll give that to you. And I, I am turning around and I'm starting to understand that I think, yeah, Mon's kind of a cool, cool villain for that reason. Number 18, Janora's natural affinity for spirits seems lazy. I didn't think about this at first, but upon my rewatch, I actually completely agree with you on this one. I think it didn't, it, or wasn't really set up enough until, you know, that season, until season two that she has this natural affinity with her spirit and i think that could have been established better and again they couldn't establish this obviously because of the production stuff again you can watch my video about the production woes of avatar legend of korra um so they i'm sure if they would have known they had more series to go with they could have established that a little bit better but as it is in the current show her spirit stuff kind of comes out of nowhere. Same with the uh, harmonic convergence and the airbenders coming back, but that's not a that's not even a question in here. But I, I also think that that one was kind of lazy. Even upon my rewatch, I was like, uh, this still doesn't work for me. Even though I'm like, oh, I'll accept it and continue on. I, I still think that was kind of a kind of a cop out too. Number nineteen, we were robbed of Gazan plus Ming Hua. You know what? I agree with that. And here's why I agree with it though. I think that we should have gotten more uh interaction with the group itself like we had a little bit we had the one scene with uh zahir and Pali right before the big battle we had that little little chihi thing between bolin and mako and gazan and mingwa and then get kind of uncomfortable but then we don't get i feel like we could have got a lot more about the interpersonal relationships of the red lotus and again that's an issue of the seasons being so short i think you could have done well by having a um a villain episode where we could just see them oh my god I just thought about that. What, what, it would be awesome if we just had an entire episode with them. Like, like, like you know, we have like a, you know how you have Zuko alone or or um, Korra alone or you have um, the beach or anything like that. It would have been dope to have a Red Lotus centric episode like the whole way through and we can just see what it's like them interacting with each other and maybe talking about, you know, old times or just being normal because we always see them as like these um these anarchists who are like you know these radicals but not just like being people all the time except for those little slivers of moments i want to have more of those moments and i think that would have been amazing number 20 i like that the past live connections were broken off making Korra the new first avatar or as i call it the new one it added an interesting dynamic and idea of her finally having to take responsibility and understand herself and her role as Avatar from then on. Yes, I like this um, personally because it, I think it, it works well for giving consequence to the world. Like we have Roku talking to us in book two saying that, hey, you know, if you're in the Avatar set, you're at your most powerful, but you're also at your most vulnerable. And actually being able to see 
you know, the negative consequences of that and having it stick is really, really works for me. And what I like about it mostly too is that I think the past lives are a little bit overrated. And I think that kind of showed itself in book three of the original series when Aang was, you know, consulting with all his past lives and they all gave him advice that wasn't what he wanted to do. He had to go to the lion turtle and, and figure out a new solution beyond just, yeah, you got to kill Ozai. You know what I mean? Like, I, I think that there is wisdom to be had from the past lives and, and just in the past in general. But I also like the idea of the consequence of that and, and having that stick. And also the idea of um, paving your own way and, and paving past the past. Past the past. That's a weird, past the past. Anyway, next one. Number 21, I think that the characters are more interesting in Korra than Avatar by concept, but Avatar developed its characters better. Yes, I think I would agree with that. I would agree with that. I think Korra conceptually, foundationally, has something that could have gone much deeper, but yes, it's, the, it's in the execution that it falls short. Whereas I think Avatar, the original series, is a little bit more simple. Um, and was able to execute that simple concept very well. Cause you know, it's basically just the hero's journey, like all the, the steps are exactly the same, but they do it extremely well. And I think that's a little bit better than, you know, having a really cool foundation. Like we can discuss it, you know, all the time, but it's it, to, to, to see it executed so well. Yeah, I definitely, I agree. I agree with that. Number 22, Pabu is better than Momo. I'm gonna be honest, I don't actually care about either of these characters. At least I, I like um, Naga, I like Appa, but I never really cared about Momo. And you know what? Maybe I do like Pabu a little bit better. I think I might have to agree with you on this one. I do think Pabu is better than 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 Momo a little bit. Just, just a little bit. But that's only because I really don't really care that much about Momo, to be honest. Except for the Appa Lost Days episode, where we see Momo on it by himself. That's the only time I cared about Momo. Otherwise, he was I was very just indifferent to him. Number 23, the bending in Legend of Korra isn't just punches and kicks, isn't lazy. Yeah, I think a lot of people equate the, the bending style uh, of, of the punching and kitchen, uh, kicking based solely on pro bending, but don't actually analyze the rest of the fights that happen within, within the series. This series has some of the best fighting uh, in, in the entire franchise, and it's not people just punching and kicking. It's, it's them doing traditional martial arts against and also you know integrating uh traditional martial arts with a more modern take on on bending which i like because it's definitely um uh, comparative to our real world in which case you know east asian martial arts was very much regimented and separated but then as we've gotten in our modern society we have mixed martial arts now and that was you know the the catalyst or the the, the pioneer of that was bruce lee himself which is why i say be water my friends at the end of the videos some of you young people don't know this and it troubles me but yes i actually enjoyed that that aspect of the the bending but i think people do oversimplify it and think that that's only what legend of Korra has to offer if you actually do look at all the fights throughout the entire series you see tons of traditional bending i think even someone made a, a gif gif animation uh about uh the same bending styles that happened in the original series that were happening in legend of Korra, and people don't seem to talk about that they just talk about the punching and kicking like that's all that there is in the entire series which is totally untrue number 24 the last one if avatar the last airbender was never created everyone would like Korra just the same um i don't think people would like it just the same i think they would like it better though i think people would have been impressed by it i think people would have liked it but i don't think people would have I don't think it would have been as popular as Last Airbender was back in the day. I think it would have been known as a really cool series. I think it would have continued on to, you know, make more stuff. I think comics still would have happened and, you know, all the novels and everything that came after it. But I don't know if it would have been held in such regard. But I do see where you're coming from. I do understand what your meaning is behind it and that the reason people put Korra so much lower, lower than it really should be is because uh, Airbender came before it. But I agree that if Airbender didn't exist before it and Korra stood on its own, I think people would have received it a lot better. But that is it guys. Let me know what you guys think about these unpopular opinions. Let me know what some of your unpopular opinions are. Unpopular, not popular opinions. I think people kind of forget that when they're talking about Legend of Korra, but okay, I get it, I get it. I'll see you guys in the next one. Uh, see you guys in the comments below. Peace, love, and remember, be water, my friends.